Hello. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a freelance software developer. I do uh, mainly work for artists, theatre groups, and prototyping Internet of Things products for large companies. Um, and tonight I'm not going to talk about anything <coughs> as practical as that. I'm going to tell you about my last holiday and show you some holiday snaps. Uh, but first I should give some context. This is my second favorite website, Alibaba. It's brilliant. It's basically like eBay, where wholesalers list their products, and you can buy them in bulk direct from the factory. Um, and I love it, because it's got seemingly everything. Uh, everything you could possibly want, such as if you would like a pair of 3D cinema glasses in the shape of Harry Potter's glasses, you can get those. There are 134 different versions of it made by 18 different manufacturers. Maybe you want a pair of scissors with a laser in it, so that you can aim your scissors straighter. Except the laser is on your hand, which is the bit that's wobbling. Anyway. Or maybe you would like a, a mobile phone that's uh, the size of a key fob. Um, this style of mobile phone is... Uh, the last I heard, the uh, UK government were considering banning it because it's found a very specialised use. Um, it's popular amongst prisoners, uh, because of its shape and size, it's discreet enough to be concealed about the person. Um, and I particularly love this because I don't think anyone sat down and like, wrote a prisoner persona, like, what are, what are the user needs of the prisoner? Like, I think it was just someone going, like, oh, what have we got? We've got some, some mobile phone parts and a small key fob. Could we just like, put them together and see what happens? And this is my favorite product. This is the 808 keyring camera. Um, there is no 808 company, there's no uh, specific product called the 808 camera. What there is is uh, a series of factories in the Pearl River Delta who are all taking cheap mobile phone components, uh, the leftover cameras from, say, a failed Nokia phone, uh, combining them with a key ring and making a tiny HD camera. And there are probably about 40 different versions of this so far. Uh, this is my favorite website on the internet. This is <laughs> Chuck Moore's Guide to the 808 Camera. He buys every one of these that he can find and then categorizes them. So he's the one who's detected the 40 different strings uh, so far. And he, he'll just take them, he'll disassemble them and work out, like, oh, this one's got different components than the last, it's got a different spec than the last, it's a different version. And what he finds usually when he pulls it apart is that it's basically a repurposed mobile phone. When he decompiles the firmware, he finds uh, ringtones and other leftover bits of software from a mobile phone. And so, uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, in the place I was working at the time, Watershed, an arts organization in Bristol, and we had uh, Chris Anderson in to do a talk. Uh, this is the Chris Anderson who used to be the editor of Wired, not the Chris Anderson who runs TED. And he was promoting his book, Makers, which isn't to be confused by the book, Makers, by Cory Totoro. He needs a disinvacuation page. Um, and he was telling us about all the wonderful things you could do uh, as a maker, how making things was so accessible these days. Uh, and particularly, he was telling people excited about things like uh, Alibaba, where he uh, and his company, DIY Drones, were trying to build quadricopters for people. And they couldn't find the right design of motor. So they went to Alibaba, they browsed for all the options, couldn't, still couldn't quite find the motor they needed there. Um, luckily, on Alibaba, you can chat directly with the factories. It's got a live translating tool, so you can just type in, and it will translate to the factory what, you, what your uh, message is. And so he asked the factory, can you, can you make a motor in this spec? Uh, with like specific size, specific number of turns of wire. And they're like, sure, we'll get this done for you, we'll ship it to you, we'll get it in six weeks. And he was like, this is brilliant. This is robots in China making exactly what I want with no effort. Uh, which frustrated me slightly because it's probably not a robot on the other end. There's probably a, a room full of people who are twisting wires around and hand making these. Uh, for a robot to be doing it, you'd need to be doing something in a greater volume that he'd be doing it. So I thought I'd go and try and visit all these Alibaba manufacturers to actually see how the process works, who these designers are, and where these things come from. Uh, which is how I found myself in the city of Yiwu. Uh, it's a four-hour train ride outside Shanghai, and this is Yiwu Market. It looks like any shopping centre you'll, uh, you'll find in any city. It's got, you know, nice big atriums, escalators, uh, occasionally background music playing. But this is entirely a shopping mall uh, for wholesalers only. When you go in here, you can't buy one of an item. You can only buy large bulk uh, orders of items and get them shipped to you from a factory. Um, 
and it's vast. It's far bigger than any shopping center I've ever been. Uh, this was the nearest entrance to my hotel. It's entrance number 59, uh, in, which is in District 3. Uh, you'll find stationery, sporting goods, paintings, uh, I believe umbrellas in this particular building. Um, the entrances go all the way up to about 120, uh, and it's split, split amongst entire districts of the city. There are five districts of Yiwu Market uh, spread about the place. And when you're inside, uh, it's split down by type of product. All the products here are what are called small commodities. Um, so there's a section dedicated to cosmetics, uh, zippers and belts. <laughs> Maybe you're looking for needle woven fabrics or socks. Um, Yiwu makes 50% of the socks in the world, so half of you are wearing socks from here. And it's got marvellous slogans describing the place. You can enjoy the journey of wealth through the various commodities. It's a sea of commodities, a paradise for shoppers. And you can find anything. Uh, this is the inflating toys section of the so toys department in the ground floor of District 1. Um, any type of inflating toy you would like. Uh, there's a shop specialising in eyes for toys, for the manufacturers to uh, put whatever type of eye they would like on their toy. Um, this shop makes oh, this shop makes pink injection molded plastic buckety things, uh, buckets, stools, potties, hand baskets, uh, and they're in a corridor full of people who make uh, injection molded plasticky things that they're competing with. Uh, you can find anything you want. Multiple toothbrush manufacturers, multiple washi tape manufacturers, an entire department dedicated to umbrellas. Uh, and each of these booths is the showroom for a different factory in the surrounding area. Uh, uh, creating competing pro products. Uh, one of my favourite areas is the tourist goods section. Uh, these, are, these are decorative plates and mugs for every city in the world where you might go on holiday. Uh, you've got Rio de Janeiro next to Paris, next to London. They're all kind of slight variations in the same <coughs> modified stock photography. Um, so if you're wandering down, say, uh, the tourist shops in Cambridge or London, you, you will see these exact products. You'll see the incorrectly printed tube map suitcase. Uh, it's got uh, products for every Spanish beach resort you might want to go to. So these are for Ibiza, Mallorca, wherever you want to go. Um, and when we were visiting, it was just after the World Cup, so there was lots of sporting goods available. Uh, and there's lots of other things you might have for a sporting event. Uh, flags, vuvuzelas, uh, competing vuvuzela manufacturers. Um, especially a lot of products in green and yellow, because uh, they can't use the trademark of the World Cup of the uh, upcoming Olympics, but they can definitely brand it to the country. Uh, anything you might need in any possible variety. Um, it has an electronic section. Um, the electronic section in Yiwu uh, doesn't make uh, advanced products like mobile phones. Uh, you'll find those in uh, Guangzhou or Shenzhen instead. Uh, what you find here is the um, mobile phone accessories. So there's a large amount of USB cables, iPhone chargers, iPhone cases, uh, occasionally the, knock the occasional knockoff segue, uh, LED signage, a large section dedicated to LED signage. Cat pillows? I don't. There were multiple competing cat pillow manufacturers. I don't know why. Um, and it's just endless. The corridors go on forever. I, I spent an entire day walking from one end to the other. Uh, I got out at 9 a.m., I just walked, and I got to the other end at 5 p.m. Um, I caught the shuttle bus that does a loop of the outside of the shopping centre, and it took an hour. And surrounding it, you have all the supporting infrastructure you need for this market. You have banks, you have. Uh, uh, logistics agents, you have uh, restaurants and business hotels and bars, uh, you have restaurants for every possible style of food from every country that they supply to. So there's a section which is full of uh, Russian uh, establishments, a section full of establishment buyers from the Middle East. Um, you find just weighing scales everywhere. And we were there on the 1st of August, which meant it was Christmas. Or rather, it was the end of Christmas season. A lot of the Christmas uh, showrooms were packing up. Uh, having already taken orders between March and August, um, you find all sorts of Christmas decorations, artificial Christmas trees, every possible uh, decoration you might put on your tree, 
every variation of Christmas hat or stocking. And we were lucky to meet um, someone who owned a Christmas decorations factory, who took us on a tour of their factory. And in their factory, they have their own showroom. And the showroom has every possible variety that they offer of every possible Christmas decoration. If you're not quite happy with the uh, slight design variation on your Santa and Snowman stocking, they will make uh, all the different possible iterations of it. Uh, and they target multiple different markets. I think a lot of their buyers were from Austria and Bavaria. Um, it's just vast. And it goes on. And they have a designer who just churns out slight design variations to try and find, uh, through brute force and the market, what products work. Um, they also take custom designs from the buyer. So if you don't like any of these, you can submit your own design or they make it custom for you. But what they'll do is, if your design was successful and you ordered a lot of them, they will just manufacture it for anyone else and offer it. Um, they see no problem with uh, IP there. The only thing they care about is trademarks. They won't reuse your trademark, but they'll be happy to relabor it under someone else's trademark with the same design. Uh, when we were there, there were giant piles of Santa hats lying around being manufactured for a UK charity which sends Christmas presents to every British soldier. Uh, so these are probably on their way to Afghanistan currently. And the city of Yiwu is a landlocked city. It's uh, a few hours away from the coast, but it has a port, uh, a port without any ships. This is uh, uh, the port of Yiwu. Um, the port of Yiwu is special in it's designed to uh, process all these small commodities. Uh, so normally when you buy stuff and you fill it into a shipping container and send it uh, to another country, the container contains only one type of thing, like tires or wood. The problem is that Yiwu makes small commodities, and you can't really fill an entire container full of toothbrushes by itself. Uh, so they have sp uh, specialist custom facility here that specialise in putting multiple different types of things in the same box. And when you get there, you can kind of tell what the... Uh, uh, how the building works just through the Wi-Fi networks. Um, and what's special about the custom facility is it's also a warehousing facility. So all the local suppliers will ship their stuff to the warehouses in the, in the uh, port where they will be combined together and sent to the same uh, buyer. So, um, for example, a pound shop from the UK will go to you, they'll spend a few days walking around going like, we want that, 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 stick it in our brand, send it to the same warehouse, stick it in the same container, it comes over here, it gets put on the shelf of Poundland. And so we were there, they were stuffing uh, fairy lights into containers and uh, sealing up the container. So this was the 1st of August. Uh, based on the unique tracking ID of the container, we could see that a few hours later, it had gone through the customs facility downstairs, done all the paperwork, the box is sealed with a plastic tag that means nobody can tamper with it. At this point, the contents of the box have left China, but the metal box itself is still physically there. Uh, it's put on a truck, which is tracked by GPS to make sure nobody can intercept it or modify its contents, and taken to a nearby port of Ningbo, which is about a five-hour drive away on the coast. And then it's loaded onto one of these ships and sent to its destination. Um, the container we saw being packed uh, ended up six weeks later in New Delhi uh, and is already for sale. Um, and so to more completely follow the supply chain, as well as seeing the wholesalers, the factories, uh, and the customs facilities, uh, we obviously had to see how they got uh, to their final destination. So uh, we, we boarded one of the container ships. And when I say we, I was traveling with a, a, a group of people uh, with the Architecture Association in London who run a group called Unknown Fields, run by Liam Young and Kate Davies, <coughs> who run expeditions every year to explore different architectures, different infrastructures. And so this year we spent a week, uh, 18 of us, on container ships traveling around the East China Sea. And then we went around China itself visiting electronic manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, mines, all of the supply chains that make our mobile phones and all the products that we buy. Uh, and so the port of Ningbo that we visited is, is just on this little horseshoe here. It's this little place. And it looks like this when you pull it at night. It's just blinding spotlights, cranes, and millions and millions of boxes. Uh, and its defining feature is this, the world's tallest electricity pylon. Uh, <coughs> when we got aboard the ship, you have a, a pilot who guides you safely out for the shipping channel who uh, told us all about Ningbo and was really enthusiastically trying to encourage us to visit. And this was the uh, sales point that he had for us. Um, the ships are uh, quite automated spaces, so for me as a software developer, it's quite interesting to see how much of it was automated. 
Um, so, for example, no one on the ship knows what's in any of these boxes. All they have is a unique ID, and they have a piece of software called Lodestar. And they don't even choose where on the ship the boxes go. Lodestar decides what its destination is, what its correct loading is, what its weight is, what its value is, whether it needs electricity, whether it needs <coughs> extra supervision, whether it's full of dangerous cargo, such as, uh, what did we have, seatbelt inflators, and uh, fish meal, which is uh, rotting fish guts, which is probably the most dangerous cargo we carried. Um, the ship is also uh, in fully instrumented. There's sensors everywhere that constantly monitor the ship and make sure nothing's going wrong. Uh, this is an alarm box. It's in every room on the ship. It knows who's on duty on the ship. And any time something goes wrong, it knows which rooms to set an alarm off in to summon the right person. So if it's an engineering problem, it knows who the ed engineer on duty is and wakes them up and tells them to go to the engineering room. If there's a bridge problem, it'll summon the captain. Uh, and I was in a room which isn't normally used, so my alarm box summoned me for everything. <laughs> so I was trying to drift off to sleep one night, and this thing started going off. So I was like, okay, I'll go see what it says. And there's a screen which says what the problem is. All the errors list on the side, it's got a time log. Uh, and the problem at this time uh, was main engine system control failure. I thought, <laughs> this sounds interesting. We've only got a main engine. There isn't a secondary engine. Uh, so I stepped out of my room, and the second engineer was getting out of bed and rushing downstairs, and I went up to the bridge to see what was going on, and it was pitch black. Uh, we were in the East China Sea. We were just coming out of the remains of the typhoon. Uh, there was lightning storms off to the port side, and it was completely silent because the engine was off, and this was a novel experience. And so they were kind of uh, hurriedly steering us out of the shipping lane, making sure we were safe from collision. Uh, and it was very tense. And a few minutes later, someone restarted the engine, and it was fine. And I went back to bed. And the next morning, I, I got up. I went down to the breakfast table, sat down, started eating food. And the captain comes down, joins us at the table, and he goes, ooh, major disaster last night. And I'm like, yeah, the engine failed. And he goes, what? Oh, no, that happens all the time. <laughs> OK, wait. What disaster are you talking about? He's like, the mail server went down. <laughs> uh, the mail server? Yeah, it turns out everything they do is done by email. Like, the instructions which port they're going to, what cargo they're picking up, where they have to be at which time, what fuel consumption they need to use, who they need to communicate, it's all done by email. Which means on the bridge, um, as well as all the navigation equipment, you have a little desktop computer called Seagull, where they can check their email. Uh, which is a highly secure system. <laughs> uh, and it sits alongside all the other equipment, such as the autopilot, the Ectis. Uh, and these are all just desktop Windows machines running Windows 2000, and they occasionally blue screen, uh, which is why there's a redundant pair of them. Uh, and to, to set the course of the ship, you just click on the map where you want to go, and you just make a little line of dots, and the ship will automatically pilot itself to those positions. Uh, whilst keeping up a lookout for collisions on the radar, and it'll warn you of any dangers, and it'll do things like adjust the speed so that you get to your destination at the time you're meant to, to reduce fuel consumption automatically. Uh, and so there's, uh, you know, server cabinets full of stuff uh, to run all these systems. Um, one night I was chatting to the captain about the electronic navigation system, which they're not meant to use when they're visiting Australia or New Zealand. They have to switch to paper maps. And I was asking how they do this, and he's like explaining how you navigate without the, the computer systems, because our captain was uh, nearing retirement, so he'd done this before GPS, because GPS has only been around since the 90s, quite a recent invention in maritime terms. And he's telling us about the uh, sextant and how you sight the stars and how you find out where you are. Uh, and I was like, well, that's brilliant. Have you got one? Can you show us? And he was like, yeah, it's in this cupboard. And he opens this cupboard, which says map charts. And it's just a, a, a HP server in there that's holding all the map data. And he's like, oh, not the right cupboard. He finds it, and he, he shows us an ever-redundant pair. And they still get tested on navigating through analog methods. Anyway, eventually we reached uh, the port of Yantian. Yantian is the port next to Shenzhen. So this is the port that all the electronics uh, coming to Europe come out through. Uh, it's, it's next to the Hong Kong border. You'll notice that side of the key doesn't have any ships docked on it because that is the Hong Kong border. If you docked a ship there, it would be straddling two territories, uh, which would be legally complicated. Um, and it, the ship is highly instrumented, highly automated. Apart from when you get to shore, there's no like distance sensor on the side. They just lean over the edge of the ship and check if they're close yet. <laughs> Uh, and like, you know, there's a team of guys whose job it is to like tie uh, more of the ship, tie up the rope, pull it in. Um, 
Anyway, uh, so on our voyage, we, we, we saw the, the shipping supply chain. We went to the markets to see where these things are made. We saw the factories of how they were made. Um, the rest of the people in the group went on to Shenzhen and Guangzhou around here, which is where all the electronics are made, which is the bit I was excited about seeing, which is the bit I didn't get to see due to complicated immigration law reasons, which I'll explain in the pub later, because it's a long story and ended up with me being detained for a few hours. Um, but I did get to see uh, the very origin of the supply chain story. These are rare earth metals. These are the um, uh, materials that we need to make microchips, magnets, uh, uh, shiny glass polishing chemicals to tidy smartphone screens. Uh, and the, the, China has the world's monopoly on the supply of rare earth metals. Uh, so we went to Batao in Inner Mongolia, which is one of the places, one of the few places where rare earths are mined and processed and refined. And we toured all the refineries there and saw how these things were made. Uh, so this is the, the ingredients you need to make high strength magnets. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't show you many photos because it's an incredibly secretive industry. Uh, they wouldn't allow us to take cameras into any of the facilities. Uh, they, they were very protective about like what's even happening. So we're like, what is this? What are you making here? And they're just like... <laughs> uh, we had a very helpful guide who pointed out that um, all the local uh, uh, museums that used to explain how the rare earths processes worked uh, have been uh, simplified recently and no longer explain how the actual processes uh, in the local factories work. Um, the, the, the town is a steel manufacturing town, uh, so these are uh, Baogang Steel, the local steel manufacturing uh, facility, uh, which takes coal and uh, 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 takes all the raw materials and produces uh, steel. Um, but as a byproduct, it produces rare earths. And uh, this large tailings pond, uh, which is apparently quite radioactive due to the I can't remember the specific material. One of the byproducts of the rare earth process is highly radioactive, and uh, they just put it here uh, in this vast lake surrounded by uh, artificial um, uh, a wall, which uh, is leaking and uh, getting into local drinking water, unfortunately. Um, and they showed us all the, the machinery that makes this stuff, and I have no idea what it does. This somehow makes a magnet. <laughs> Uh, these magnets. Uh, and we also met the uh, people who run these factories. We met um, uh, some of the, the, the heads of these companies. And um, the whole local business process is very informal. It's a very small community and it's very clubby. So we end up in all these kind of private uh, members clubs and, quite, and little uh, coffee shops uh, where all the deals are made. Uh, and so, for example, we were invited out one day. We toured a factory, uh, a refinery. And the leader of a refinery said, oh, you should come uh, for lunch with me. And he took us out. And we thought, all right, this is going to be like, you know, company canteen, disappointing sandwiches, awkward conversation. Uh, it turns out he'd booked one of the dining rooms in the Rare Earth International Hotel, which is the tallest building in Batao, uh, hired some of Mongolia's uh, best singers uh, to entertain us, and uh, kept plying us with very strong rice wine which afterwards we found out was only available to government officials and was 300 pound, British pounds a bottle. And we went through about 10 of them. Uh, and this was at about midday before we had to go to another factory. <laughs> it seems the, the local business culture involves lots of drinking uh, and making a fool of yourself uh, to gain trust. Um, down the road from Batao is the city of Ordos. Um, the local area, instead of letting the wealth from the rare earths industry leave, has uh, put a lot of the money into building an entirely new city. It's a city for a few million people that they're currently building. Um, and if you read, say, coverage in the BBC or Time magazine, uh, you'll have heard of this city, and it's always described as a ghost city, a, a massive folly that's uh, completely devoid of people. And so we went there to see this folly, uh, and uh, it does look abandoned and deserted, uh, if you photograph it right. Uh, so we went to this bit, which is like one of the bits that is full of large tower buildings and it doesn't look inhabited yet. Uh, but if, for example, you pulled out your phone and looked at Wi-Fi networks, you'd see there's like 20 residential Wi-Fi networks nearby. Uh, so it is inhabited. And once we were photographing this bit, the, uh, the local police turned up and we were like, oh great, time to like hide our SD cards and take away the photos and <coughs> do all the usual process when we're stopped in uh, these kinds of places. 
And actually, they turned out to be super friendly. They were like, hey, you're visitors. This is lovely. Uh, they gave us directions to other bits of the cities that could be made to look abandoned if you were <laughs> a photographer. Uh, they gave us restaurant recommendations and told us where the bit of the city with all the actual people was. Uh, so this is like the local uh, lake next to the park, which has um, this massive Las Vegas-style uh, booming music light and fountain show. And it's just got like thousands of local people hanging out there with a uh, kind of a bustling street market. Um, and it turns, uh, it turns out that the, the narratives we saw in the press were like completely exaggerated. Um, there are bloggers who specialize in going to these places that the press lists as uh, abandoned cities or abandoned developments in China to show actually usually they're not. Usually they've just been like built and no one's moved in yet. It's because it's only just happened. There's an amazing story where uh, CNN filmed like this uh, abandoned business development and the person went there, found the exact spot they'd filmed from, and it was from a skyscraper in a busy office, filming out across the bit of the city next to the skyscraper that was still building, whilst they were surrounded by people who lived there and worked there, and they are perfectly happy to spin the wrong narrative. Um, uh, so that was our journey. We, we, we went there and saw for ourselves, uh, almost as tourists, uh, how the supply chain works. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you. Did you achieve your objective of meeting the people who hand-wind the uh, No. no. Uh, uh, yes, that partly comes from, um, oh, I can't remember her name. There's a photographer and ethnographer who's been, she's been studying um, <coughs> the region in Ghana that processes most of, uh, a large amount of e-waste. And she found from locus, interviewing the workers who work there that they were kind of, fed up of all these European and American photographers coming there, taking their photos to use for like New York Times pieces and exploiting their image uh, and then just never coming back. Um, and so uh, we were kind of trying to uh, be more um, aware of issues of consent. Uh, so uh, I don't know, it's kind of walking into a factory that's full of people working and then just like taking photos and of people just doing their job feels a bit strange. Uh, and because it's kind of, uh, uh, they thought we were buyers making a purchase for Christmas products, uh, you can yeah. really uh, have uh, a, a, an open, comfortable dialogue with people working there. Um, so uh, specifically in the factories, it was very difficult to uh, find out what people's personal individual experiences were. Um, the bit where we spent uh, eight days on a container ship, that was a very different experience. Um, we were traveling with Maersk, who don't normally allow passengers on their ships. They only allow journalists, writers, that kind of thing on their ships. And before we got on board, they sent us instructions. Uh, and the instructions were like, you can go anywhere on the ship. You can talk to anyone. We won't like send you a media, me uh, a media handler. These people have no media training. You can just ask them anything and let them talk openly. And that was a very different experience, because you did a, a week with these people uh, where you got to know each other, got to know each other's life experiences, and people would uh, speak very openly. They, they were perfectly willing to say all of the bad things about working on a container ship or uh, problems they had with Maersk as a, an employer. Um, so it was a, a very different experience going into uh, a random factory for an hour uh, as opposed to spending a week uh, working alongside people. Um, so yeah, that, that's why there's no real uh, photos of people. Uh, I didn't get manage to meet anyone working in electronics uh, because I didn't get to uh, go to that region. Do you speak Chinese? Uh, no, unfortunately I don't. Um, we had uh, some people in our party who speak uh, Chinese and Cantonese, um, and we had uh, someone who's helping us arrange all the visits. Um, so you, communication wasn't an issue, uh, but it's more having a space where people can communicate away from their employer, for example. That was a bit harder, especially in the, the short period we were visiting in. I'd quite like to go back and spend more time. Somewhere like uh, Batao, you could spend like three or six months just kind of 
hanging around the local coffee shops, getting to know people so they trust you enough to actually write and share. Um, having found out about the supply chain and kind of the decision about it, how might it change the way you work with technology? Uh, I'm still struggling with that. Um, the initial impression was like, I don't want to make a physical product ever again. Because, like, especially walking around Yiwu, it's like ev everything has already been invented. Like, we don't need more stuff. There's enough stuff here. And it's like, uh, especially Yiwu, uh, like, the, it's the kind of products that go to a pound shop. Uh, and it's all injection molded plastic. And it's kind of, you just know it's all going to be junk soon. Uh, and it's kind of like, it's like where they manufacture the specific trash vortex. Um, so I've kind of been much more reluctant to do product development, um, but I don't know what to do as a, a broader answer to this, um, uh, especially since uh, this specific area, the area around you was a, a quite a vaguely impoverished area before this industry, um, because uh, the land in the area wasn't very good for farming. So people would frequently struggle for food. And that's much less of a problem with these kinds of jobs. But they might not necessarily be good, comfortable jobs. So yeah, I'm kind of torn. Um, uh, one direction is, um, have you seen the Fairphone project? Uh, it's a group of people developing a smartphone that you can buy. And they're being very clear with their supply chain, they like they, they try and find out where the raw materials come from, make sure they come from mines and refineries with good conditions, uh, that the factory that makes the phone uses good conditions, but they're also um, uh, promoting social change in the structure of the uh, <coughs> supply chain that makes their mobile phone. Um, so for example, uh, a certain amount of the money that goes to a factory has to go into a, a workers fund pool, and the workers get to choose and vote what this money is spent on, like, you know, do they want pool childcare? Do they want a gym? Do they want, I don't know, better food at lunchtime? Uh, they can spend the money from the revenue from the phone manufacturing in that way. Uh, and they're being really open about the process and trying to make it in a way that other people can repeat the same process, uh, which is quite a nice approach. You say this was part of a course of uh, it was run by uh, the Architecture Association School in London. Um, they do roughly two trips a year, one of which is for their students, um, and one of which is for anyone in a related design field who wants to go. So this is open to anyone. Uh, so it wasn't through like a course I was studying. Uh, yeah. Do you fund yourself or do they fund it? Uh, I funded myself for this. Um, but it's, it's heavily subsidized. So for example, Maersk pays for the ship bit, uh, as opposed to if you went on a holiday on a container ship. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have another question. Is it the first time you're presenting? Uh, no. No? And uh, w what was the reaction of, of the, the audience to, well, what could be said to be uh, yeah, poison, uh, <laughs> uh, bad social, uh, I mean, no absence of social uh, benefits, basically, etc. What, what was the reaction? Oh, um, presenting this material. Yeah. Um, I've not presented the manufacturing side of this material before, uh, so I don't know. Um, sorry. Are you going to be around afterwards, then, Dan? Yeah, I'll be around in the pub. Great. Thank you very much.